This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 691, recorded on December 9, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, it is 36 Fahrenheit, 2 Celsius, and it's getting ready to flurry here. <laughs> is that right? Very uh, Yeah. But I heard, yeah. I heard it's going to be like 58 on Saturday and raining. Is that right? I, I don't think it's going to uh, stay snowing for very long, but um, there are flurries right. on their way. And from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. It's uh, a little different here. <laughs> it's uh, 58 degrees, headed for 80 today. Wow. And sunny. It's an absolutely gorgeous day. We're in the mid-40s overnight, 70s to 80 during a day for the next few days. It's just gorgeous. And from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 38 Fahrenheit, which is 3 Celsius, and it's going to get up to 45, which is 7, and it's a gray day, but it's a good day for podcasting. <laughs> Today we have something a little different for you. We're going to give you a very brief break from COVID-19, but not really, actually, as you'll see. Uh, we have a sci artist joining us, Laura Splann. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, as I told you in the pre-show, I've been following your work for quite a while. And uh, in the pandemic now, it's easy to get people on since we're Zooming all the time. You know, pre-pandemic, it was always a chore to get people on. But uh, so we're happy to have you and talk about your science-inspired uh, work uh, today. But before yeah, I'm excited to share it in this uh unusual context for me that has such a specific focus that I often obsess on in my own work. <laughs> yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, we've talked a lot, in, not a lot, but on and off in TWIV about the intersection of science and art. Of course, science is an art in itself, right? Uh, but then art is depict depicting science and so forth. Um, so it's good to have someone on who thinks about it more than we do. So it's really great. Um, before we, we uh, have a look at some of your work, and, and Laura's going to share some uh, with us, give us uh, a little history of where you're from and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so it always feels like such a big question. Um, <laughs> but I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee, and um, I was surrounded by a lot of influence that I think come out in my work. Um, there's a lot of textiles and fiber in my artwork, a lot of needlework processes. And the women in my family used um, a lot of these processes in just garment construction. And um, my grandmother was a prolific quilter, but she was also a nurse in the army. And um, so there was both this creative craft influence from her, but also she, you know, was a, a medical professional that worked in a military uh, wartime uh, context. And, um, and then my father also worked for a company that manufactured uh, surgical and medical supplies and instruments and orthopedic devices and implants. And so, um, there was a certain amount of infusion of biomedical imagery around the house, just from catalogs and things that he would bring home, including videos of knee surgeries that I enjoyed watching. <laughs> and um, so there, there's some influences there that, that I think might be uh, clear in, in my work that I'll show today. Um, and I, I actually, even though I kind of grew up um, being exposed to craft and painting and art in rather traditional and conventional ways, 
Um, I actually originally studied biological sciences in college at UC Irvine, and I was interested in becoming a veterinarian. And um, but as I was taking electives in both the humanities department and the art department, I got more and more interested in art um, and this kind of new introduction to new kinds of art that I was having in the art department there that was much more conceptually and politically based and um, work that was very invested in like the procedural qualities of performance. And um, so I just kind of got more and more um, enamored of art and, um, and was making work uh, even then that was about the body, but much more from a feminist perspective than, than a perspective that was so grounded in science and, and medicine. Um, so that kind of evolved in different ways um, after, after school, um, particularly when Dolly was cloned. That was like a pretty clear turning point for me in my work where I realized that all of these conversations that um, were being had around um, what we should and shouldn't change about bodies um, and what is normal and abnormal, what is order and disorder, um, was actually bringing up a lot of the same questions that um, I think feminism was questioning around like prescribed notions of gender um, and bodies that are circumscribed by culture. So um, it, was, it was intriguing to me that, um, that Dolly's cloning was, I think, bringing more people into the conversation and kind of opening up the conversation to a broader um, audience. And also all of a sudden everybody was a stakeholder um, in the results of genetic engineering. Um, so that was really when I started to bring science into my work more and more, um, but still continued to work with um, a lot of tools and processes that relate to craft and textiles. So after you finished at Irvine, and by the way, I'm sure all of us know someone at Irvine that you probably interacted with. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you have any anteater inspired art. <laughs> I don't. Um, yeah, it's a funny school. It was it was a really wonderful school, and um, it was it was total culture shock going there from Memphis to Irvine and California in general, and um, it, and I coming from a high school that was really really uh, enthusiastic about football. It was nice to go to a school that didn't have a football team. <laughs> Um, but, but I remember going on the tour of the campus and the, what really sealed the deal for me was, um, when they show you the buildings where Planet of the Apes was filmed. So I was like, okay, I'll go here. Yeah. I was going to ask, <laughs> I was going to ask what the inspiration was to go to Irvine from, from Memphis. Did you look at a lot of different places where you're drawn to California? What was the deal? I applied to every UC school, <laughs> hmm. uh, because you could fill out one application, mm -hmm. um, and all the California state schools as well. Um, so I definitely wanted to leave Memphis and go to California. Mm. And um, I applied to some other schools too, but because I was interested in being a veterinarian, UC Irvine had a really strong bio -sci program. So, and it was a beautiful campus and um, there, were, there were a lot of things about it that I liked. Um, but uh, that was that was sort of a clear indication of it being a good choice compared to some other schools that I was looking at. So now you're in Brooklyn, is that right? Yeah, I'm in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And so I've been what's here. the what what is the path from Irvine to Brooklyn? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so after uh, after finishing my undergraduate at Irvine, I moved to San Francisco and I lived there for 10 years. And um, I actually was, you know, I eventually got a studio and was making work and um, was making work that was starting to use more uh, 
biomedical imagery and, and artifacts. And actually at the time in Oakland, California, there was this amazing warehouse that you could go to called Chemicals for Research Incorporated, which was a, a just enormous warehouse of surplus biomedical supplies and equipment. So I was buying all of these like test tubes and magnetic stirrers and beakers and making sculptures, kinetic sculptures with them. And, um, and so I was making art. I was also working at a media art center and engaging more and more with technology and software and video and um, web technologies. Um, so in programming, getting more into creative coding. And um, so I worked at this facility for about 10 years and, um, and also pretty early on began teaching there. So I was teaching um, video editing and web design and um, digital imaging and motion graphics and, and learning a lot at the same time. Um, and so that was actually a big influence as well on where a lot of my work now has started to engage technologies more and more. Um, so I lived in San Francisco for 10 years, was, was teaching a lot, um, doing a lot of tech teaching, making work, showing work. And then I did, I went to graduate school there as well at Mills College, um, which is a small private uh, women's college in uh, Oakland, California, uh, though the graduate program is co-ed. And, um, and had some really wonderful experiences and professors that were extremely engaged in intersections of art, science, and technology. And, um, and I even was able to do independent study there in the microbiology department and um, worked on kind of a performative photo project involving the collection of, um, of microbes in public spaces and then growing them and documenting them in different ways. Um, and yeah, so then I, I moved to New York in 2005 and um, Vincent, you mentioned GenSpace before um, and GenSpace has been an incredible resource for me while I've been here where I've been able to um, continue a lot of kind of experimentation and exploration and independent study into laboratory processes and tools and techniques. So you you go to GenSpace and you're able to do some laboratory work and that can help inform your art, right? Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have uh, quite a few workshops that are anything from really basic lab techniques to, um, you know, PCR. They have like a PCR pizza night every once in a while. And, um but they also have a lot of uh, technology classes as well. I'll actually be showing a project that was developed somewhat out of a class that I took at GenSpace um, that was um, using Arduino physical computing. So I've done a lot of work with physical computing and creative coding and um, using sensors. So sensors on the body. Um, so yeah, it's... Um, you could, you know, you you can in a non-pandemic world, you can go there and take classes and use the lab. And um, and I've actually been taking a couple of classes or a few classes now, I guess, um, online with GenSpace. Um, so I, I, you know, my my process definitely um, relies on experimentation as much as it does um, just really a love of learning and like a curiosity about, um, about different scientific tools and technologies that, um, you know, it is often just kind of scratching the surface on, on these different disciplines, but um, always trying to figure out what, maybe an artist could do differently with these tools that nobody in industry would ever try to attempt. So are, are there any specific, you know, experiments or techniques um, 
it, with biology that you've learned that have really inspired you. Um, I can imagine our listeners getting a kick out of thinking about um, something they do in the lab, um, inspiring an artist. Yeah, yeah. So um, some of the projects that I'll talk about today involve bacterial transformation and working with plasmids, um, in uh, which is a, a commonly used technique in biotechnology. Um, and the the um, the physical computing work I mentioned uses electromyography. Um, and also, uh, I did some other work with the less electroencephalography, so reading muscle movement and brain waves, and then basically collecting data um, from the body using these tools. Um, and then thinking about ways to translate that data differently, uh, visualize that data differently, uh, materialize that data differently than um, anyone in the medical profession would ever maybe think to or need to. <laughs> um, and then more recently, um, which I'll be showing today as well, I've been working with uh, molecular visualization software um, to create uh, animations with different protein models that I'm using that are available from publicly um, public online databases that I'm loading into the software and um, using, using the software in, in um, kind of quirky ways that um, uh, are basically, I, I like to use thing, use tools and kind of do processes wrong <laughs> to kind of see what will happen. So a lot of the things I'm doing in this software are um, what you might call doing it wrong and, um, and using the tools in, in more playful ways, but also kind of looking not just creatively, but also critically at the tools and looking at naming conventions and looking at interface design and, um, and the, the kind of um, narratives that are embedded in the design of technologies and tools that scientists are using. Um, and, Laura, I yeah. have to tell you that I have several mistakes that have turned into art pieces in my office or over my lab bench. Oh. So oh, I can nice. totally relate. Yeah. yeah. One was not mine, but someone didn't realize that our baking oven is not like an autoclave. And so they had a paper ice cream cup with a bunch of different colored plastic tubes in it and it all melted and is beautiful, but she was in tears over the fact that the <laughs> oven had to be cleaned out and it was a big mess and stuff. But I saved pieces. And when she left the lab, I gave her a couple because at the time she was too distraught, but oh, it's, no. it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe the, the artifact of that can transform her memory of it <laughs> into <laughs> something more positive. So Laura, I'm curious in your, in your introduction, you described, um, what sounded to me like a, a significant social motivation in your art, social issues motivating your mm -hmm. art. And I'm curious as to uh, how that continues into the present and whether you still feel that and how, how that, you know, where, what, what for you is the sort of interface between social issues and, and art in general or your art in particular? Yeah, I think that interface is often tactility and detail. So getting people to engage with, um, with objects or images in a sensory way um, and, and getting them to kind of using that to leverage people's attention um, and then sort of start to unpack um, the, the meaning of the materials I'm working with or the meaning of the tools and processes I'm working with. Um, and, and as that happens, these narratives start to unfold that are not just about the present, but they're also about the past. So, you know, a lot of materials have, um, you know, complex baggage that is not just about who the material relates to, but also it's, you know, how it's made. So I like to kind of, I guess, plant clues along the way of what um, appear to be kind of singular or autonomous objects, but, but sort of plant clues 
within the work and among the works that unfold a more complex social narrative. Um, and of course that's going to unfold very differently for everybody because sure. everybody brings different um, personal history to, to the work or even a, you know, deeper or shallower understanding of, of what the material even is. Um, so um, that's, you know, there's, there's kind of a fluidity there, but um, you know, I think with the, um, the kind of combination of these textiles, materials and processes and, and then using technology um, and then also often referring to biomedical imagery and tools that it's the work is still is, is really kind of just moving among these different social issues that relate to how our uh, how our how we understand our own bodies through science and medicine and its tools and technologies. Uh, and the, a, a, fra the key phrase for me in what you've just said is leveraging people's attention because right? <laughs> that's something we struggle with all the time. Okay. And once you generally and genuinely engage somebody's attention, uh, you know, there's all kinds of potential. You can take them anywhere. That's, that's great. I think that, yeah, uh, yeah. that the, uh, there, there are times where this works, like you said, Laura, uh, the cloning of Dolly was one, not Salvador, but the sheep Dolly. <laughs> <laughs> and CRISPR was certainly another one. And now, of course, the pandemic. And as pr science uh, advances, I think you engage the public more and more because you are going to change people. And I think that really engages people. And of course, a pandemic does automatically because it affects everyone. We've seen that on TWIV and I'm, I'm sure you've seen it as well. Yeah, and it's been really interesting to see and hear the reception of work I made um, 18 years ago about viruses. <laughs> Um, immediately change that all of a sudden um, it's not the work isn't as niche and there's a wider audience and a wider understanding for it and um, and so I'm I'm finding myself um, kind of changing my own tax tactics I guess in leveraging people's attention that um, there's certain things that I used to have to kind of do to get people to kind of understand something or say to get people to understand something better. And now there's a shorthand um, for a lot of um, a lot of the things that I used to have to explain longhand. It's funny that you <laughs> yeah. say niche because TWIV was a niche podcast and, and less so now maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so Laura, really oh, hungry go. for, sorry, I, I think people are really hungry for, information on a variety of topics relating to the virus. Um, I was curious about how the pandemic has influenced your work, both in terms of kind of inspiration, but also in terms of, you know, day-to-day -day issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think one one thing that happened right away was going back and looking at work that I made in 2004 around SARS, SARS-1, now called SARS-1. <laughs> um, so going back and looking at that work again and rethinking it in some of the ways I just mentioned, but, um, but also, yeah, like kind of thinking about some of the the tools and processes I was already in the middle of in some some new work that actually are quite related to um, some of the conversations and, and issues and science around SARS-CoV-2, um, such as antibodies and um, the production of vaccines and antiviral treatments and um, and even this software that I mentioned, the molecular, the molecular visualization software, um, I was working with before the pandemic. And so I've continued to work with that, um, which I'll, I'll show you some examples of, but it was an interesting um, tool to, to already be working with because when, um, when shelter in place policies were put in place, um, 
I was able to continue working at home on my computer on work that was kind of already in process, but also um, work, incorporate some of this, uh, some of the more topical material, such as SARS-CoV-2 models into workflows and, and projects I already had going. Um, so, so yeah, I think, but I, I do think like the biggest shift that I feel is just that there is this, you know, immediately global audience for, for work that, um, I think unfolded much more slowly previously, um, for, for people. And now, um, there's a lot of elements of it that are more immediately relatable for, for a, a, a lot more people. So yeah, thanks again for, for inviting me and, and letting me share my work with your audience. And, um, and it's, it is exciting to show this work and it's an honor to show this work in the company of the crucial topics and complex science that you're exploring on the show. Um, and I, my work as a whole, um, as I mentioned, explores intersections of art science, technology, and culture, and the unexplored terrains between these often separated territories. And I make conceptually based artworks that connect the material artifacts of science to poetic subjectivities of the seemingly mundane or familiar. In this latch hook series titled Vigilant, I created a modern twist on the tradition of the needlework sampler. So here are microbes such as Ebola, smallpox, and anthrax are cheerfully rendered as brightly colored studies. And I created the series in response to what were known as the Amerithrax attacks, in which letters containing anthrax spores were mailed to news media and Democratic senators. Um, Americans were told to remain vigilant with no clear indication as to what that, that meant. So they began stocking up on duct tape to seal the windows of their home from potential bio bioterrorism. And at the same time, hosting Botox parties in the comfort of your living room was emerging as a fun activity for you and your friends. And so I'm fascinated by these contradictions in our interactions with the microbial world and how our everyday relationship to it is informed by influences other than science. And I often try to destabilize and reframe our relationship with the everyday and to even redefine what the everyday means. I created this lay SARS doily in response to the first SARS outbreak in 2003 and our increasing unease with the microbial world and evolving relationship with truth as it was mediated by different modes of knowledge production. This project was grounded in the intricacy of textiles and its associations with the familiarity and comforts of domesticity while also being driven by a deep fascination with the seductive and sometimes alien representations of the biological world. I was playing with multiple layers of camouflage. Doilies themselves might serve to hide a scratch or stain on furniture, and the aesthetic conventions of lace serve as camouflage for the structure of an enveloped virus. Here, the DNA, RNA, protein spikes, and lipid envelopes become unassuming decorative motif. And the ubiquity of this often overzealously produced family heirloom might also be equated with the spread of a contagious disease. Collective traumas born from disease, from epidemic, from pandemic, are rematerialized in an heirloom artifact to be passed on from one generation to the next. I often try to compel an intimate engagement with detail, calling into question how things are made and what they are made of. And I use processes and tools that challenge notions of what is made by hand and what is made by machine, what is natural and what is constructed, and what is science and what is culture. And while simultaneously mirroring the conventions of radial doilies 
and superimposing the morphology of enveloped viruses onto tradi traditional lace patterns, the doilies have inserted themselves like a virus into the collective consciousness that is Google image search when searching for both doilies and for viruses. <laughs> This project led me deeper into the layers of scientific representation, biomedical imaging, and the ways that bodies are translated and abstracted with technology. I'm especially interested in the history of inventions of scientific apparatus and the cultural circumstances in which they are conceived. The history of Rene Lenick's invention of the stethoscope in 1816 is fraught with varying accounts of its conception that cite gender relations as much as technical research in auscultation. One version of its invention tells a story of a female patient who by some accounts was too modest to have Lenick lay his head on her chest. By other accounts, it was he that was too modest. Lanik's solution to this socially awkward moment was to roll up a sheet of paper to create his first iteration of the stethoscope. The stethoscope itself embodies a social paradigm, a prescribed comfortable distance between doctor and patient, male and female. In my stethoscope sculpture, I extended the length of the instrument to 25 feet, the longest distance at which one can still hear a heart beating at the other end. Its absurdity belies its continued, albeit diminished function and questions the technical standards on which an institutional device is based. My embodied object series used electromyography sensors to create data-driven artworks using this common medical diagnostic technique. Neuromuscular activities associated with experience of experiences of wonder were performed as facial expressions and bodily movements, such as smiling in delight, blinking in disbelief, and frowning in confusion. Each activity produced unique data captured by an EMG sensor that was translated into a curve using custom software, which I then used to create data-driven patterns and forms for 3D printed sculptures, including furrow on the left, blinking twice on the right, frown, and smile. The project examines the potential for objects to embody human experience and to materialize the intangible, to rematerialize our corporeal experience of wonder. And I was playing at the edges of what is perceived as voluntary or involuntary movement, performed or felt emotion, fake or real data. The title of the series Manifest is a nuanced word that offers a variety of interpretations. As an adjective, it refers to the way the sculptures render obvious the unique neurophysiological phenomenon of each performed movement. As a verb, it refers to the emotional significance that the movements communicate, such as frustration or happiness. As a noun, it objectifies the body as a vessel whose contents are to be cataloged in detail. I was also inspired by Charles Darwin's spatial feedback hypothesis from 1872, in which he posits even the simulation of an emotion tends to arouse it in our minds. His theory suggests that physiological changes caused by an emotion not only express that emotion, but also enhance it that we can manifest feelings by performing their expression. I also created data-driven patterns for computerized jacquard weavings. With this tapestry titled Undo, I recorded muscle movement as I was unraveling another weaving. I often seek out these recursive and hybrid combinations of materials and processes with technology to challenge values of the hand in creative production and question notions of agency and chance and aesthetics. This fringe effect on the perimeter of the weavings was created by unraveling individual threads by hand along the machine woven edges. The act of unraveling was particularly evocative and murky territory. What does it mean to unravel the work of a machine? Is the work of a machine less valuable or precious than that of the hand? 
with this process, as with other studio projects that engage my fingers beyond the operation of a mouse, I often find myself thinking the word undo in my head when making a mistake in a moment of absurd confusion or corporeal and technological experience, existence and agent agency. Sometimes this word, which I seem to be trying to select from some imaginary cyborg drop-down menu, is even replaced by its keyboard shortcut, Command Z. Then there's this realization that I'm not working in a digital space furnished with history palettes or autosaves, but rather a meat space equipped only with my precarious, clumsy body. These paradoxical relationships between the body and technology can reveal something about the value we place on the labor of each. In this series of performance sculptures entitled Material Expressions, EMG electrodes attached to my chest actuate a motor that unravels a scarf I'm knitting. The title of this piece is taken from Ada Lovelace's text on Charles Babbage's analytical engine where she muses that, quote, the engine may be described as being the material expression of an indefinite function of any degree of generality and complexity. My task as performer, as body, is to remain calm, to slow down my heartbeat, to slow down the motor, to knit faster than the motor can unravel my knitting, or at least to maintain a state of equilibrium for an indefinite period of time. These sensor-driven projects are part of a larger investigation of the body as material, as interface, and as data. <clears throat> in 2018, I was invited to be a bio-artist in residence at the Science Center in Philadelphia, where I was hosted by biotech company Integral Molecular, whose research includes antibody discovery. And during my residency, I had the opportunity to shadow scientists, and attend lab meetings where I took many copious and cryptic notes. And I also had unique access to move around the lab, taking many photographs and videos of often unseen vignettes of biotechnology. I was particularly drawn to the lab machines with their quirky interfaces and their often absurd language that seems now more than ever so oblivious to the problems of the outside world of the living. The images served as a document of the numerous biotechnological artifacts I observed in the lab, and I compiled them into a book called Needle of Haystack that includes the photos with accompanying texts. And this spread in the book has a conversation with an AI chatbot that starts with me asking if they know anything about molecular biology, which is answered with, there are a lot of them, real and fictional, point being I am unique and yours. And it goes on in even more convoluted ways. Um, I also began to experiment with some of the software that scientists were using for their research. This molecular visualization software works with models that are publicly available in online databases. So of course, the first thing I found myself doing was unraveling protein structures, such as this model of a ricin toxin bound to a camelid nanobody, or a structure for Z9K in the protein databank. The camelid referred to was specifically an alpaca. Alpacas and llamas have unique antibody structures called nanobodies that are easier to work with in the laboratory. And I was struck by the lab's use of non-human species for the production of antibodies. And my conversations with the scientists led to receiving over 200 pounds of wool from laboratory llamas and alpacas who produce these nanobodies for human drugs, including vaccines and antiviral treatments. Since then, I've been hand washing, carding, and spinning their wool into yarn. And in an exhibition at the Esther Klein Gallery last year, I situated sculptures made with this hand spun yarn among other artworks that examined the hidden systems and invisible labor of biotechnology. This work questions notions of the presence and absence of bodies, evoking the mutability of categories that delineate their status. 
Lumen choreographs viewers' movements to sit on a rug made with the wool of these laboratory animals. In biology, the lumen is the interior part of a cell where a protein is folded and modified. Sitting on the rug engages viewers with the unseen materialities and labor of both humans and non-humans as they touch the yarn and listen to the accompanying soundscape that layers recordings made in the lab during my residency. Another component to this project and research is an interrogation of the language that's used to explain science. This doorway in the exhibition included appropriated text from the book, Molecular and Cell Biology for Dummies, that equates plasma membranes with international boundaries and casts proteins as customs officers. The antagonistic implications of this metaphor were especially heightened by the Trump administration's zero tolerance immigration policies in 2018, for which we continue to experience the ramifications of. Viewers were instructed to move gently through a membrane of llama wool. And the text reads as they enter, the plasma membrane is the barrier between the cell and its environment. You can think of the plasma membrane as an international boundary, like the border between two countries. The molecules that act like customs officers are proteins. Receptor proteins receive signals on the outside of the cell and relay the message to the inside of the cell. So here biology gets co-opted as some sort of scientific justification for the enforcement of arbitrary boundaries circumscribed by wars of the past and the artifacts of colonialism that endure in the present. The gallery behind the curtain invited viewers to sit on a bale of hay to watch a molecular animation made with a model of an alpaca nanobody in complex with a ricin toxin. By using the specialized features of the software in unconventional ways, I created animations that are collaborative doodles of sorts between the software, my hand, and the molecular structures that are being disrupted. As the protein structures are manipulated, the software renders uncanny disturbances in the form of sometimes spastic and sometimes sublime movements. The videos are unedited screen recordings of performed interactions where my mouse is hidden. The labor of the user and the software is collapsed by the seemingly autonomous moving form. An accompanying neon sign in the room functioned as an invitation, a command, and a resignation, but also a mantra for moments of uncertainty and anticipation. While I was processing the llama wool in my studio, I would often find clumps of feces, which I began to collect for this networked laboratory mixer that is agitated by Twitter. The device activates when Twitter hashtags associated with the culturally contested status of science are tweeted. Here, the mere mention of hashtag global warming or hashtag vaccination agitates tubes filled with laboratory animal feces. Since taking office, the Trump administration has advised how to improve the chances of receiving research funding with the suggestion to avoid phrases like vulnerable, diversity, entitlement, transgender, fetus, evidence-based, and science-based. The administration has also refused to sign statements that mention climate change. As visitors exited the exhibition, faint text on a wall invited viewers to come close to read, our distance allows our intimacy. The phrase refers to the complexities of existence in the biotechnological age where understanding of our own bodies and the bodies of others is increasingly mediated by technology. The sculpture blows a breeze in the viewer's face as they read the text. And the speed of the networked fan intermittently adjusts based on the wind conditions near a farm in rural Pennsylvania. The farm is actually the 600 acre biological laboratory that gave me the wool from the 2018 shearing of their llamas. In January this year, they invited me for a three hour tour of their sprawling facilities to meet and photograph their llamas. 
as well as the laboratory where they process their biological products, such as blood, organs, and tissue. And I'm hoping to return to the farm post COVID to resume working on some photo and video based work. After my visit to the farm, I wanted to see what would happen if I brought the artifacts of this extended biotechnological apparatus back into the laboratory. What could be explored around notions of hybridity, transgression of boundaries, engineered bodies, and invisible labor? So I began genetically manipulating bacteria to produce pigment to be used to dye this yarn using bacterial transformation in which a cell is genetically manipul manipulated to incorporate DNA from its surroundings through its cell membrane. I worked with several plasmid constructs and strains of E. coli to produce different colors. And this commonly used lab technique introduces a foreign plasmid or DNA into bacteria and the bacteria then amplifies the plasmid, making large quantities of it. And a plasmid is just a small circular piece of DNA that contains genetic information for the growth of bacteria. And I was working with a few different plasmids that might be used to dye the yarn in combination with E. coli bacteria, which is often referred to as a workhorse of the laboratory. For a transformation to take place, the bacteria must be in a state of what's called competence, or having small holes in the bacterial cells for a DNA plasmid to pass through. I was particularly interested in the narrative implications of this transgression of boundaries as it was being choreographed in this decidedly Baroque approach to artificially producing pigments that already occur naturally in other bacteria. During the residency, I experimented with several bacterial transformation protocols to produce different pigment and color for dyeing the yarn, including fluorescence, purple, blue, and also green. And I worked with biologist Dr. Solon Morse to develop a number of different approaches, including soaking the yarn in bacterial cultures to create dyed fibers for new textile sculptures that are now in progress. And we also experimented with producing large quantities and comparing undyed and dyed fibers of yarn. And during the residency, I had the opportunity to teach a bacterial transformation workshop during which we also discussed the language used to explain cellular biology. And my goals of the workshop were to make the science accessible and to demystify laboratory protocols and tools but to also think critically about language used to explain the science. And the workshop included a discussion examining metaphors and meta narratives in biology texts while brainstorming for new language and metaphors to explain the science of bacterial transformation. And these texts that we were examining are often fraught with antagonistic metaphors that are grounded in narratives of trickery. So here, after the virus is attached, it may trick the cell into bringing it inside. Also competition, smaller molecules will be closer to the finish line. And surveillance, defensive proteins wander by to make sure everything is okay. And assimilation, chaperone proteins guide proteins to their proper locations within the cell. When I returned home to New York City, uh, or returned home, New York City went on pause with shelter in place policies for COVID-19. And I suddenly found myself researching this new, more deadly SARS virus that by mid-February had already caused twice as many deaths than the first had in total. And I continued to collect more metaphors and language emerging out of the communication of science around the coronavirus, finding numerous sources for inspiration in the media, including this April New York Times article called Bad News Wrapped in Protein that's populated with a motley crew of the usual suspects like saboteurs, tricksters, and God forbid, artists. And eventually the mysteries that lie at the end of the line with a melancholy echoing chain of adenine nucleotides repeating 33 times 
in a series known in biology as a termination sequence. I also returned to my molecular software animation experiments on my computer and began collaborating remotely on new animations with the scientists at the lab where I did my 2018 residency at Integral Molecular. The remote residency also consisted of virtual meetings with the scientists, including communication scientist Edgar Davidson and also president and virologist Ben Durans. And we discussed our research on SARS-CoV-2, as well as which models would be appropriate for the new animations, including spike proteins, nanobodies, and human cell receptors. And my new animations continue to explore the unraveling and distortion of the folded proteins of viruses and antibodies. This video is a 12 minute screen recorded unraveling of a SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain in complex with a llama nanobody. And I'm using the software's morphing feature to animate structures that I've been unraveling by hand. And I've become fascinated not only with the palette of colors available in the software, but also the names of the colors, especially since most viruses are smaller than visible wavelengths and therefore have no color. So the mere act of adding color is another layer of translation and fabrication. The software's palette includes references to nature that are entangled with idyllic representations of the natural world, such as blue skies, green forests, ripe fruit, and romantic flowers. They present additional layers of abstraction built into the interfaces of the technologies we use to engage with and manipulate the natural world. They function to provide both simultaneous simplification and complication of form and understanding as it becomes increasingly difficult to define what is nature, what is natural. The animations in my unraveling series attribute their titles to the software's palette. This animation is titled Lime, Limon, Forest, and its animated parts are SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins that are morphed molecular animations transitioning with their unraveled or unfolded forms. This is marine, aquamarine, sky blue. And this is orange, oxygen, salmon. After New York City began to open back up in June, BioBat Art Space invited me to do a residency in their galleries in the Brooklyn Army Terminal, where I've had the chance to install these animations as large projections with an immersive soundscape. While I was spinning threads from laboratory llama wool and virtually denaturing spike proteins, I couldn't get the echoing melancholy of the repeated adenine nucleotides in the SARS mRNA sequence out of my head. For the installation soundscape, I invited biotech scientists and workers to play the nucleotide sequence on guitar in recorded Zoom meetings. The recordings were made by simply prompting participants to play A on guitar 33 times the number of adenine nucleotides in the SARS termination sequence. The undulating animations and otherworldly guitar sounds inspired by the materiality of the devastating coronavirus are at odds with the soothing experience that visitors have described as both meditative and womb-like. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
In addition to the installation of the SARS spike protein animations as projections, I also began to expand my use of the wool and connect it with the unique experiences and traumas of this pandemic moment. One project I'm developing during the residency includes recordings of Zoom sessions with both friends and strangers around the world. During these sessions, we unravel textiles while discussing the pandemic in wandering conversations that range from the personal to the political to the social. Part oral history, part conceptual craft, and part performance art, the project attempts to unravel our unique and shared experiences of precarity, trauma, and res resilience during the COVID-19 global health crisis. And participants are mailing me their unraveled threads from these sessions, which I'm then weaving into tapestries that incorporate the wool of the laboratory animals. And I like using these textiles, materialities, and gestures in both real and virtual spaces to examine our entanglement with the biological world and the cultural constructions by which we engage with it. Constructions of worlds that are so often mediated by technology. The live acoustic guitar performance of the SARS termination sequence by integral molecular biochemist and co-founder Joseph Rucker became the backdrop for the textile installation at Biobat Art Space. The slow and persistent plucking of notes is at once soothing and stressful, invisible yet present. So you can find more information on all of the projects and watch the videos and animations in full on my website. And you can follow my BioBat residency work, including the, um, the developing weavings in progress on my social media. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions about any of the work. Um, and thanks so much for your time. That was awesome. Wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's amazing. I have to say I that uh, we totally agree with you, your dislike of anthropomorphizing <laughs> viruses. It's a big thing that we do all the time. And people seem to feel that when they try and simplify that they have to do that, but we just don't agree with that. Yeah, it works. I mean, it helps people understand the science. The thing that, um, that I was really struck by when, when I was you know, kind of self-studying some cellular and molecular biology was just how 
just the antagonism. Like why always these like fraught metaphors and, <laughs> um, and, and so it was really challenging when I taught the workshop at university at Buffalo, um, to, you know, with the students, like to try to come up with alternative metaphors, it was very difficult. Um, I think the best thing we came up with was lying in an inner tube on a lazy river and passing under a bridge, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it didn't work that well either. <laughs> so, so one of the things that strikes me, and I don't know quite how to describe this, but that comes through in, in, in your art is that so much of what we interface with directly is an indirect representation of the reality. We can't see most with our naked eye, most of the time, most of what we work on. Okay. So we make measurements about it and those measurements show up visually uh, as stuff that you could not possibly uh, relate really without a lot of intellect in between to the reality and on a different sort of plane, but in a similar fashion, your art kind of does the same thing to me. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I like creating these kind of varying levels of distance and separation and, um, obscuring and revealing things in different ways. Um, and, and it's always fun if you can kind of keep people questioning those layers and, and that are mediating their experience. I mean, even with the, the doilies, I think this kind of happens where, um, you know, the, the kind of best case scenario is that people can kind of move easily back and forth between seeing the doily and seeing the virus and that there's this kind of liminal experience or state. Um, but, but also to your point, when I was, when I'm working in this software, you know, as somebody who's not, um, you know, a scientist or, or working in biotechnology that, I constantly have to remind myself, this is not the virus. This is not the spike protein. This is a model of the spike protein that there <laughs> is this really strange relationship you develop to these visualizations and imagery and models that um, can, uh, can really kind of skew and distort your understanding of, of the invisible. I have a technical question about how you made the lace doilies. Was that by hand or by machine? They were by machine. So the um, I showed an image of the software interface, um, the software that I was using, um, which was called Baby Lock Palette. <laughs> and um, I put an, e, an accent on the E for some reason. And... Um, they, uh, the, the software lets you choose the stitch color or the, the thread color, the stitch style, the stitch rotation. So it's basically vector imaging software where you're designing embroidery. Um, okay. So that was a computerized machine embroidery process where I was embroidering onto water soluble fabric that was hooped. So um, you have to stitch onto a substrate and um, and so there's these different kinds of water soluble substrates and, and that you hoop onto the machine and then you dissolve that in water once the embroidery is finished. Very cool. Um, so they're freestanding um, doilies um, that I always show mounted on black velvet. And I almost always show them framed though I did show them in an exhibition at Davidson College several years ago that um, they wanted to have some work in their exhibition that could engage visually impaired um, audiences. So they were shown unframed and people could touch them and feel the, the um, thickness and shape of the embroidery. Nice. I have to say that um, I, we use molecular modeling software all the time and I never thought about the names, you know, and we're making <laughs> virus models. We go, oh no, that's supposed to be strawberry. That's supposed to be lime. And I never thought, and, and I love the way you, you talk about it, how weird it is. <laughs> to put it's that. very weird. The weirdest colors in the 
palette that I'm using are TV underscore green <laughs> and TV <laughs> underscore red <Wow. laughs> and blue, uh, TV underscore blue. It's like, why, why is there an underscore in there? None of the other colors have yeah. underscores. <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. Um, I, I told you we'd keep you for an hour, so I don't want to keep you uh, any longer, but I just want to say that well, this has been great. And I've now got a better understanding of and people like you who make art from a scientific viewpoint and what's underpinning it, because I really didn't understand that before. I think you would really like plaque assays, and we do them in my <laughs> lab. So I want to invite you post-pandemic to come to our lab, which is not far from you, and you can watch us do black assays. You can do some black assays, and I'm hoping you'll get you'll get inspired. You can come see my wall of polio, which is a wall of uh, black assay plates in my office. So, yeah. I would oh, and love there's that. riches. Yes. Yeah. Oh wow. You'll love it. You will absolutely love. <laughs> Wonderful. It. Thank you. I would love that, yeah. and I'm sure I would get some inspiration from that. So, uh, Laura Splan, uh, is, your website is laurasplan.com. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a blast, and I think we're going to have a lot of people really interested in your work. So, thanks so oh, much. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Pleasure. Right. It also, it's at Laura Splan on all the social media, right? Yeah. Lowercase. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Laura. This is great. Thank you. This is amazing. Thank you. It was great to meet you all. I almost don't feel like talking about science now. Yeah. <laughs> I was partway through. I, I was thinking, how are we going to top this? I keep and. thinking about um, DNA sequencing gels, old style. Oh, okay. God. Because they always struck me as really artistic in their own way and yet mm -hmm. have a really deep meaning. I don't know that she's ever looked at these. We ought to send her some. You know, I had hundreds in those big x-ray boxes, right? And when I moved to Columbia, I threw them all out. And I am so mad that I did because they were gorgeous sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and other times they sucked. <laughs> but when it worked well, right across all the lanes, perfect. Yeah. It was just beautiful. And I throw them away. I, 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 uh, why yeah, that, I do that's that? no well, good. She had in one of her um, galleries that she showed... I don't know if you were looking at some of the art on the walls, but there was something that looked almost like a Western. Yeah, um, some in the kind of gel, of yes, them. for sure. Yes, uh, and so I could imagine those dolls fitting right in. Anyway, I thought that was just awesome. I'm telling you. Yeah, it's great. Right. Mm -hmm. Just And she just explains, right, what she's thinking, yeah. and that's yep. the key. You need that, well, for me anyway. I mean, what are you thinking? I mean, you, <laughs> you ask Jackson Pollock what he's thinking, he's probably going to say, go to hell, you know. <laughs> but... <laughs> I mean, this is analytical, right? And I kind of like that because we're scientists. Yeah. Anyway, that was great. Uh, I just want to make a public service announcement here. You know, listeners may remember we advertised a position, a biosafety officer position at Columbia here. And so they have hired someone who, who responded to the ad, a TWIV listener. So that's very cool. Uh, we also advertised a technician position for Amy and Amy has hired someone who's actually come from Seattle, a uh, TWIV listener as well. <laughs> and so now we have another position to fill, the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center at Columbia University Irving Medical Center is seeking a high biocontainment laboratory assistant manager to help run the day-to-day -day operations of the center's biosafety level three core facility and to assist investigators in SARS-CoV-2 experiments. Applicants should have practical experience in performing cell culture, microbiological techniques, and basic molecular biology. Applicants must have a bachelor's degree in science with three years experience working in a BSL-3 facility or three years of non-BSL-3 facility experience and a willingness to travel for BSL-3 training. And I will put a link to the position advertisement in the show notes. Pretty exciting. Uh, you know, so I know there are a lot of people out there who are interested in these jobs because we filled two of them already. So check it out. Kathy. I have an announcement about ASV 2021. It's a virtual meeting that will be held in the middle of July. But now is the time to start thinking about the abstract deadline, which is February 1st. And there will be 
registration awards. We usually have travel awards. This year, there'll be registration awards. And those applications are due February 3rd. And you have to be a member for that. And membership for trainees is not very expensive. But the reason I'm telling you this now is because you can easily join ASV now so that that's finished and not one more thing that you have to do when you also are preparing your abstract and preparing your application for the registration award. So go to ASV.org and you can click on membership, which is found in the virus image or on membership drop down that's above the image and you can get started on becoming a member of ASV so you can submit your abstract and apply for a registration award. It's very cool. Kathy, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, so for people who are thinking about uh, submitting abstracts, um, those abstracts would be for short talks and I guess posters this year or how are posters going to be done? So we are going to have poster sessions. Uh, so pretty much as much as we can make things like a regular in-person meeting, we'll have people submit abstracts and they can preference whether they want to give an oral presentation or a poster. There's usually more demand for oral presentations than we have space for. So sometimes you don't get your first choice and you might end up having a poster, but we're going to have the posters have a, a brief uh, video presentation that people will be able to click on and see. And then the posters will actually be manned, as it were, personed, I don't know, <laughs> at, at a certain time uh, for, for each of the two poster sessions where people will be able to go by Zoom to the individual posters and, and talk to the poster presenters. So both formats are available. We saw a format that the University of Florida used. The platform that we're using, I think, isn't going to be quite the same as that, but we figure that by next summer, they're going to have a lot of really good tweaks and modifications and how these poster presentations uh, pretty well worked out. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. We have, we have two papers for you. Uh, but before that, I want to point out that here in the back, in, in honor of the holidays, we have a little same virus that you see behind Brienne. So it's like a glass terrarium. Yeah. And mm -hmm. do you have lights in yours, Brienne? I do. I need to replace the battery so they're brighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you got your battery so we can have dual uh, lights. It's the same thing, little terrarium icosahedron. And it's in a, it's it's blurry because of my depth of field here, but uh, it's appropriate. I think the blurry is. And I also rearranged some of them. Right? And I have, now you can see Mark Martin's tardy grade there, which you couldn't see before. Um he made that on a 3D printer and also the bacteriophage he made. That has a light in it. It flashes. <laughs> yeah, cool stuff. All right. Uh, both papers have been requested uh, by listeners multiple times. So I thought we would go through them. First one is published in MBio. Analysis of measles, mumps, rubella, titers of recovered COVID-19 patients. Gold, Baumgart, Oak. Okay, Licht, Fidel, Nover, Tilly, Hurley, Rada, and Ashford from uh, wow. all over the place. All over the place. Georgia, Nevada, Turkey, Rhode Island, Louisiana, New Mexico, and California. Wow. So there has been uh, some suggestion that um, in some countries, large scale MMR, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine immunization campaigns are associated with fewer COVID-19 deaths. Who would have thought? All kinds of association we're seeing these days. It's amazing. When you have so many infections, you reveal new relationships. So this paper looks at it. And so MMR vaccine uh, has existed in a couple of different iterations over the year. There's currently one called MMR2, which is made by Merck, and licensed in 1979, it has, you know, certain strains of measles, mumps, and rubella viruses. Um, and then there's an earlier, uh, there's an earlier vaccine, um, which had different rubella strain. And then there's natural infection, which uh, some people can have, older adults, including virtually all born before 1957. So I have, I certainly have, I had mumps as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it. Um, so they're saying, what's 
what, what is it? Is it all of the above or, or one of the above? So they did a very straightforward study. They got 50 subjects um, with various states of COVID-19. And I have to say, this is open access and figure one is like it. Uh, it's just amazing because they, they plot the mean titer uh, to mumps virus because it turns out that it's the mumps virus component of MMR2 that's the key. And it's not being infected with mumps virus. It's not measles, titers. It's not rubella. It's mumps from the vaccine. Go figure. And the, the graph shows different categories of COVID-19 severity. So they, for example, they had 10 patients with what they call functionally immune. They didn't get sick. But had very significant exposure. Yeah, that's the thing. They had exposure. I don't know, you know, and, and say that they each had several days of exposure to an actively symptomatic person who was positive, like a housemate or a spouse. They took no distancing or other precautions such as wearing masks. So they should have been infected, but who knows, right? It's only 10 people, but I mean, that's one of the caveats, right? Anyway, they had the highest mumps titer. Um, remind me, is this, this is ELISA titers, right? Is yes. It, I, I think, think so. so. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the, the asymptomatic group had, all right, so the, the functionally immune, 172 units per mil. And then the next group, asymptomatic, yeah, you know, infected but asymptomatic, eight people, they have 100. So it's lower, lower titer. And then the mild patient, 17, is even lower, 61. The moderate, 34. And then the severe, only titer of eight among four people. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's an association for sure, but it looks pretty amazing, right? It does. Yep. So, and as a matter of fact, in their interpretation, it, it, it's, uh, it's as if the uh, antibody titer is kind of a proxy for what might really be going on. I mean, it's mumps, but they have other explanations that I won't attempt. <laughs> so those, those were a lot of numbers. So to state it uh, in a way you might be able to easily remember, there's an inverse correlation between the titer and the severity. Or if you have higher antibody titer, you show uh, that's correlated with less symptoms or disease. If you have lower antibody titer, you have more severe symptoms. And again, it's the mumps titer. It's not the measles. It's not the rubella. It's not natural infection with mumps. It's this particular mumps vaccine. Right. It, that, that to me was sort of the most curious thing. Um, I can come up with um, some interesting questions I have about um, what's going on here immunologically. I, I have lots of um, things I would love to see in some of these patients. I have these grand ideas of what's going on, but every single one of them falls apart when I think about the fact that this wasn't seen with mumps, infect, natural mumps infection. Um, and so that, that to me, while, like I said, I can come up with some, you know, other experiments I'd love to see. Um, the fact that this was seen only with the vaccine and not in natural infection does puzzle me um, a yeah, bit. Yeah, it is. That, that observation about natural infection, because we haven't discussed that they have a, a comparison group, okay? That's uh, 30 individuals. Uh, all of whom were born uh, before MMR2 was uh, licensed. So these are people who could not possibly have gotten MMR2. That makes them over about 45 years old or, or something uh, like that. But uh, within that group, they didn't see anything like this correlation, even though some of them had significant mumps titers, presumably from a natural infection. And frankly, although I don't have an explanation for it, this to me goes back to many conversations we've had about the differences between the immune profile that you might get from a natural infection to what you might get from, from a vaccination. And the, in the uh, down in the nitty gritty of uh, the tumble of uh, T and B cells and 
helper cells and et cetera, there are probably some differences that might explain this. That's as close as I can get. Yes, absolutely. I think the one thing that is also really interesting, and I have lost my cursor, so I can't scroll down to oh, the paper. Oh, here right it is. I got it. Paper. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so one thing that's also really interesting is to note that the immune response differs between different uh, pathogens. So even though this is an MMR vaccine, you're getting vaccinated against all three, um, the details of the immune responses of those three viruses you're making are different. Um, and the one thing that we know about the mumps response, they talk about this nicely in the discussion, is that of the three, the mumps response wanes the fastest. Um, so you lose immunity to mumps quicker than you lose immunity to some of the others. Um, and so there is certainly something unique about what's going on with this immune response um, that was even known before this. So they, that's the other part of the paper. They have a graph, figure three, where they show COVID-19 case prevalence by age from January through September and ages zero to 44. And you can see pretty low up to about 14 years of age, and then it starts to increase and then peaks about 21. And about 14 is where they say the titer, <laughs> the, the mumps titers decrease below 134, which is kind of that inflection point where you start to get more symptomatic disease. So it, it correlates with decline of mumps titers by age as well, which is very interesting. I like the way they did this uh, age analysis because they say publicly available case things are usually in broad swaths like less than 20, 21 to 29 and so forth. And what they did is get, they got data from CDC with COVID-19 case totals by individual years of age and divided those totals by the uh, estimated 2020 population of the United States for each age. And so they got what I think of as a really good analysis of the age distribution. And that's what's yeah. to build yeah. figure three. Yes. The other so aspect, the, go ahead, Brian. Oh, so I was just going to say the, the thing that's, you know, particularly interesting to me is that we have, um, we talked a little bit before about some other studies that have said things like BCG vaccines being protective or things like that. And often immunologists have invoked this um, area called trained immunity. So the idea is that um, it's almost like an innate immune memory or perhaps, um, you know, you recently were vaccinated um, against whatever. Um, I know you've also talked about this a little bit with Tumakov. Um, and that gives you, say, an interferon response. And you happen to have more interferon in your body because you got a vaccine that day. And that happens to also luckily protect you against um, coronaviruses. And in no cases here are they looking at people who have recently received the MMR. This is the MMR giving them kind of long-term protection. Um, Vincent was just talking about the, the part about 14 years um, and antibody responses. And so this also sort of makes you question what type of immune response is yeah. really important here, whether this is adaptive. To trained is not 14 years, right? It's more of a no, trained. No, not at all. It's more <laughs> like a year or so. Yeah. Now, the other, the other th point that's of interest is that in the U.S., there have been 65% more COVID cases diagnosed in infants less than 12 months than in children two years of age. And they say, okay, so the infants get their first dose of MMR2 between 12 and 15 months of age, which is kind of interesting. And they say the, the younger ones, um, well, so the younger ones don't have the protection conferred by MMR2. They haven't been vaccinating yet, which kind of is another correlation that's interesting, right? And kind of in support of this idea. But they do say that some there is some protection in infants because not every infant gets infected and they think it might be transplacentally acquired uh, MMR antibodies. But that, that no, because you're saying adults lose them after 14. So why would the mother have them and protect the kid? So that doesn't make any sense, does it? Or am I thinking right. incorrectly? Well, if I think if the mother is young enough. 14? I, I mean, if she's, no, oh no. But if she's... <laughs> 
Uh, well, they 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 do say that not everybody that's in their forties yeah. has Could has be. a low antibody titer. I, yes, so you're right. Yeah. It's just like individually specific. And, and what I meant by young enough was like not uh, uh, so old that, that that they didn't get yeah, MMR yeah, sure. too. For but example, I, and I know some some people have babies at fourteen. I understand that, but I don't think it accounts for all <laughs> like, these cases. No. All right. In yeah. thinking about the difference between uh, the natural infection on the one hand and the vaccination on the other hand. I know that when uh, companies uh, combine vaccines to give you three in one shot, there's always uh, at least consideration of what impact that might have on your um, response to the vaccine. And I think testing done as well. Uh, and I wonder uh, if that could play into this, if the difference between being uh, immunized with three agents, replicating agents simultaneously, might influence the immune profile relative to getting a natural infection with just yeah. a single agent. For I'm, sure. I'm totally making this no, up. No, it's true. Question. It's true for polio. When you give trivalent OPV, you have to give it three times because each time... Only one succeeds, to use a word that Laura didn't like, but only one replicates <laughs> enough to give you an immune response. Then you do it again, you get another one, then you, you get three. When you do monovalent, you get way better immune responses to the vaccine. But, you know, it was decided in the 60s that that was difficult, so it wasn't done that. But now it's being done more as we have eradicated types one and three, uh, types two and three. Um, so the, what's the mechanism? I don't know, but they suggest it might be homology. What's the likelihood? It's two different virus families, right? It's paramyxoviruses right. and coronaviruses. That, and they say there is some sequence homology, or you know, between uh, the, the spike of mumps and SARS-CoV-2. But they also say measles too, and measles doesn't work. So, yeah. So, so the data they present from. Um, the infants and the the children completely argue against what I'm going to say here. So I, I fully understand that. Um, but one thing that I would really love to see, and there's, you couldn't really do this, is to look at these people's mumps titers before they were infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, because one thing I wondered is, um, did do people who have low mumps titers get severe COVID, or do people who have severe COVID lose their mumps titers? Hmm. Um, it could go, the, the, the correlation could go either way here. Um, and there was a previous paper that we've talked about on immune um, where um, SARS coronavirus 2 was destroying germinal centers um, and messing with the adaptive immune response. And so I was wondering when I read this, is this the effect of severe COVID destroying immune responses and mumps being the most susceptible to destruction or is mumps actually protective? Um, and so it would be really, it would be cool, not that I don't, that you would have these data to see what people's mumps titers looked like before infection. So it should be boosted by infection also if there's a cross reactivity, right? Right, exactly. So that's a reviewer three uh, comment there, Brianne. Uh, there should have been some. Dis I I really like that as a something that needs to be considered in this. Uh, you know, that's that's more because I've also spent a lot of time thinking about that Germinal Center paper um, mm -hmm. that it struck me um, when reading uh, this. Now they suggest that we should have some randomized controlled clinical trials of MMR two. I don't see that happening anytime soon because we're about to start immunizing a lot of people. However, if you want to go out and get an MMR vaccine, go right ahead. <laughs> yes. More people that have it, the better. Andrew Wakefield, notwithstanding, okay? Go get an MMR2 vaccine. And if you're 50 years old or 60 or 70, you show up at your doc and you say, give me MMR2. And they go, what? Why do you want this? <laughs> Tell them. I don't see why that is a problem because the vaccine is safe, right? And... Um, yeah, what, worst case, you're going to boost your measles, mumps, and rubella responses. Yeah. I don't think you need right. to do a clinical trial. You can't at this point, but for sure, take it. MMR2. Yeah, it did cross my mind as I was reading this. Hmm, maybe I because should. Because I, I haven't had MMR2, <laughs> well, and um, I would do this actually. 
I would actually do this. The other thing I found interesting is that around the world, the MMR is not always the same. And what it varies in is what uh, mumps it has in it. Mm -hmm. So some outside the United States don't have the Gerald Lynn strain, isolate, whatever it is called. Gerald yeah. Yeah. Lynn, yeah. That's Maurice Hilleman's daughter, by the way. Mm -hmm. He was uh, mm -hmm. a guy who worked at Merck for many years. I have his biography here on my show. Here it is. Ah. It's a great book. Paul Offit, Vaccinated. One Man's Quest to Defeat the World's Deadliest Diseases. It's about, um, what's his name? I already forgot his name. Maurice Hilleman. Oh, <laughs> God, I'm just, just worthless. Anyway, his daughter had bumps. And they say in this story, he ran to the lab, brought a swab and a tube and swabbed her, isolated, and that became the vaccine strain. How about that? Isn't that cool? <laughs> so now she's, she's probably alive because he died. She's probably, every time she hears Gerald Lynn, she goes, oh, dad, why did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Very cool story. All right. So the other paper people have been uh, asking about, actually a topic, not paper, is should we be using ivermectin to treat? COVID-19. So ivermectin is a very well and widely used anti-parasite drug. It's used for river bindless and other parasitic infections. Um, the trio of Nobel Prizes given out a couple of years ago uh, included... What's his Bill name? Campbell. Bill Campbell. <laughs> Bill Campbell. You should know because he's a, he's a faculty, honorary faculty member there. Um, yes. And uh, he, he, was, he worked on it at Merck. I have to say, what years ago when my son interviewed, he, he visited Drew, and that day, all these signs all over campus, to our very own Bill Campbell, congratulations. <laughs> I don't know over. if you remember, all of the signs said kudos for some reason. I mm -hmm. took a um, picture of it. Whenever I see the word kudos from now on, now I you think remember. of you know, being excited about Bill Campbell. Anyway, so Mer manufactured by Merck for many years, uh, relatively safe, but, and we had Doris Cully on a while ago to talk about whether it was useful for SARS-CoV-2. Because a paper was published showing in cell culture, you can add this drug and it will inhibit virus replication. And as she pointed out, this, the levels you have to add in cell culture to get inhibition are way more than are licensed in people. All right, In people, you get one dose. And if you need another one, a couple of months later, you get it, but it's based on your weight. And it is not licensed to give at levels which are hundreds or thousands of times higher in those cell culture experiments than are licensed for use in people. And she said you could do a trial to see what the toxicity is in people because she, she said – and she worked on ivermectin at Merck. And she said in mice, you can give them increasing amounts of drug until they die – and that's a certain amount of milligrams per gram of mouse weight. And you can extrapolate that to people. And they backed way off of that when they figured it out in people. So that was the issue. That's why she was a little negative on it. Yet people said, let's try this. And there have been a number of papers. And this one is, is in press in an International Journal of Infectious Diseases. It is a five-day course of ivermectin for treatment of COVID-19 may reduce the duration of illness. Now, if you got to put may in your title, you're already screwed. Okay, May, really? Um, anyway, this is out of uh, Bangladesh uh, and Singapore. Um, the first author, Sabina Ahmed, and the last author is uh, Wasif Ali Khan. So what they did was to, first of all, take hospitalized patients. And right away, I will say, from what I've learned from Daniel Griffin, by that time, if you are hospitalized, it is a bit too late to be giving you antivirals because virus is not your problem at that point anymore. Okay, just saying Daniel would agree with that. So they took hospitalized patients and they gave them two different things. They decided to throw in doxycycline into this, you know, as Daniel would say, do no harm to your patients. Don't give them a cocktail. <laughs> But they tried ivermectin alone, 12 milligrams once daily for five days, or in combination with doxycycline, 12 milligrams ivermectin single dose, and then doxycycline uh, for the next four days, for the next five days, okay? And doxycycline is an antibiotic. 
And they say it was used because it has some, it's an, a potential inhibitor of the viral, the papain like protease. Hey, remember that? Remember papain? <laughs> we talked about that last week. <laughs> I like that protease. <laughs> Very tasty. So that's why they threw this in. But let me tell you 12 mg of ivermectin once daily for five days is not approved in the US at least. No way. Did I put in the show notes what is approved? Yes. Yeah, somewhere. To... One dose only, depending on your weight. If needed, can be repeated every three to 12 months. This dosing is not approved in the U.S. You can't just do a clinical trial like this. You would have to first do a dosing trial. All right, so they did this in Bangladesh. Okay, that you can do it there. So what did they find? First of all, let's just focus on ivermectin because I don't think doxycycline did anything. Uh, by the way, I don't think you mentioned this, but it's 72 patients. 72 and so patients. We, have, we have three arms, placebo combined and ivermectin alone. And there's about 24 patients, uh, 25, whatever. And these 24 are 24 patients, and 24 one or two in each dropped arm. Out. Yeah. And these are, again, hospitalized patients. Okay. So what are the results? Mean duration of hospitalization after treatment, 9.7 days in placebo. 10.1 days ivermectin plus doxycycline, 9.6 days ivermectin alone. Main duration of hospitalization. That's no difference, right? No difference. Right. right. A fever, cough, sore throat, no difference in the groups. Nothing. The only thing that changed a little was mean duration to viral clearance. 9.7 for the ivermectin, this is days, 11.5 ivermectin plus docs, 12.7 placebo. So the three days, you you decreased the, the clearance of vir viral clearance. But as I say, the virus is not their problem. In my opinion, virus is not their problem. Now, of course, I have never treated a patient for any reason, so... However, I've listened to Daniel enough to understand that if you're in the hospital, uh, you don't need an antivirus. That's why remdesivir doesn't work. That's why the monoclonals don't work so well in hospital because the, the viral phase is over. So this has very little effect once you're in hospital. It could very well be that if you gave it earlier, like they're doing now for the monoclonals, if you're an at-risk patient and you're tested positive, they can immediately start you on a monoclonal. That makes sense because you're still in the viral phase. They could do that here. However, the dose is a problem. You can't give this dose in, a, in the U.S. So they say uh, the sample was too small to make any solid conclusions. So they provide evidence of potential benefit. I don't see any evidence for potential benefit because there's no difference really in hospitals say there's no difference in symptoms. The only difference is a marginal effect on virus loads at, which, at, point, at the point in infection where it doesn't matter. That's why I'm not excited about ivermectin. I could be yeah, they, wrong. They try to make an argument that, oh, maybe this means that our patients will transmit less um, when they've been treated because they have reduced virus. But I would kind of like to see uh, some more data on that um, before they make that kind of a Frankly, point. if you're in the hospital, they got you all gowned up and protected and the, everybody's, you're not going to transmit. It's not, that's not where transmissions occur. That... <laughs> That's why we could beat SARS-1 because most of the time the transmitting patients were in the hospital. So that's not an issue. So I don't have a lot of excitement about ivermectin, folks. And I know a lot of you wrote in and you want to know why we aren't talking about this. And it's basically doesn't do very much when you do a trial that involves levels of the drug that we can't use here. Now, if you wanted to try it earlier, fine. But I think a clinical trial is very expensive. And right now we need a lot of money to distribute vaccines because it's expensive to distribute vaccines. 8.4 billion it's going to cost to distribute the vaccine in all the states, apparently. So I think you have to Plus, focus. as you pointed out, as you pointed out, if you're going to do this in the in the U.S., you'd have to start out with some sort of dosing trial or something like that. Yes. Uh, I suppose. Yes. So. Yep, absolutely. So they, that's what I think. What do you think, folks? Make sense? Yep, ditto. Yeah. Okay. Yep, I agree Absolutely. with you. However, the MMR stuff is really interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so Charles sent me a link to the uh, Pfizer FDA briefing document. Tomorrow they're going to 
the FDA is going to go over their results and probably give it an EUA right away. You know, Kathy, it makes me think of the polio licensure in Ann Arbor, right? They, they got the data on that day at, in Rackham Hall and they approved it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Remember? Yeah. I know you don't remember, but you know the story. Well, I remember well. hearing about it at the 50th anniversary. Yes. Yeah. And I still have the, the pin you gave me, by the way. Mm -hmm. Polio Pioneer's pin. Pioneer Pioneer pin. pin. Uh, I'm at home today. I don't have it. I have to show it sometime. Yeah. Um, anyway, this is a cool document. It's a 97 page document describing all the data that Pfizer has given to the FDA about their mRNA vaccine, phase one, phase two, phase three trials. I think it's very granular, right? <laughs> you can see what happened to everyone. And um, I put two graphs in the show notes, which are efficacy rates by different ages and male, female, white, black, Latino, Argentine, Brazil, US, which is where they did some of the trials. And they're all, you know, high 80s to 90s. Um, Frequency of side effects, because people are very concerned about side effects, right? It's, I get a lot of questions. I'm really worried this hasn't been tested enough. Uh, main side effect is fatigue. And 60% of vaccine recipients report that. About 40% muscle pain, 20% joint pain, and less than 20%, about, it looks like 18 fever, 100 or greater. So, yeah, one other thing that... I think is important to point out is, you know, there is that 60% almost that experience fatigue. Um, a third of the placebo recipients um, developed fatigue. Yeah. Um, you know, Probably a third of us right now are tired. Yeah, right? 2020 <laughs> um, seems to, you know, <laughs> result in fatigue. So um, I, I thought that was sort of an interesting thing to, to notice. A couple of points so I saw a Wall Street Journal article where they said the FDA analysts found it will require testing in larger numbers to confirm that the vaccine is effective in preventing death. They conclude the data were limited to assess the effectiveness against transmission, which I couldn't find any data on transmission in this document whatsoever. So I don't know where it says limited, but maybe there's something we don't know about. Because, Completely limited. Because they're not looking. <laughs> they are, <laughs> if you, if you, so if you're a vaccinated or placebo and you, you you have some symptom, then you get tested to make sure it's COVID, it's SARS-CoV-2, right? That's the only nasal swab they do. They aren't doing anything else. So I haven't looked at the data, but if if they're saying they didn't have enough sample size to assay effectiveness in preventing death, then what their endpoint is that is successful is uh, reducing disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And not anything like you said about reducing transmission. No, nothing. I, I can't so even see like that they've, they're the looking at that. got it wrong somehow. That's true. Yeah, it is the Wall Street Journal, right? Even the, uh, even the impact on whether or not you have severe disease is a secondary outcome. That's right. Okay, the primary outcome is any disease any at all. Disease. So That's right. death is not even being scored or it's way down the line or there's not enough data. And the last thing that I found was interesting. They actually tested some kids down to 12 years of age, mm -hmm. which I didn't know. I thought it was 18 and up, but apparently they have some 12, 18 in that group. So that's cool, right? Mm -hmm. And if I, last note I wanted to make is that... Um, you know, that we're going to start immunizing soon in the U.S., maybe even this weekend, I understand. And um, so a lot, a lot of these vaccines, although I think Pfizer not, but certainly Moderna and others have been, you know, subsidized by the U.S., but there's no money provided by the U.S. to distribute the vaccines. There's nothing for hiring people to give them, making sure they get both shots, I mean, I was reading an article yesterday about this logistics. It's just, I mean, you have to keep people six feet apart. They're all going to be lined up. You don't want them to get infected in the vaccine line, right? And a lot of these places are making tents outside for this, and it's freezing cold. The logistics, and you know, every state is different. We have a totally decentralized healthcare system. Every state's on its own. Some are really good. Some are worse. States don't even know how many doses they're going to get. And they say they 
some state officials estimate they will need 8.4 billion to distribute the vaccine and the feds are not providing any of that. So this is not yet over, folks. Yeah. And Kathy, you so, wanted to mention something. Yeah, I think it's also important. We've talked about it before, but even after people are vaccinated, they may still be able to replicate and transmit the virus. In other words, they may be silent spreaders and still need to wear masks. So I know of someone who was uh, going to the Zoom meeting of discussion of this with the medical personnel at their university and the message didn't come across, she didn't think very clearly, even among the medical personnel that they might still be contagious. Uh, for other people. And there was a nice article in the New York Times yesterday that described that as well by Apoorva Mandavili. So I think that's something that, you know, even TWIV listeners can say, you might get the vaccine, but it doesn't mean that you're not replicating the virus. That there's a difference between what's going on in the lung and, and what's going on in the nose. And that New York Times article talks a lot about the mucosal immunity and, and so forth. Yeah. Is is there any data on this? Are there any data on this one way or another? Okay. I mean, we don't really, uh, the, the notion that you uh, could still get infected and transmit virus asymptomatically once you've been uh, vaccinated is a perfectly reasonable idea. But, well, I guess... You know, you'd have to be looking at the vaccine trial yeah, to, yeah, nothing. in a in a in a even a much more granular way to know. It's something we may Look, find out eventually, have, but it's a, a realistic enough possibility so yeah. that you got to pay attention. Oh, I think it's very look for other vaccines. They you clearly have shedding in vaccinees polio. Mm -hmm. Both vaccines you shed polio after after vaccination, no question. And if you look at the common cold coronaviruses, right, you have immunity. It's it. It wanes, but you still have enough to suggest there's memory and you still get infected and shed and transmit. That's the way those viruses work. You just don't get sick. So it's very likely that you're going to. And, and in people who have recovered, we simply don't have enough data on reinfections to know what's going We know there are very rare reinfections as far as we can tell. But, um, you know, whether they're shedding, we have no idea. So you people, uh, I know you're right, Kathy. People think they're going to get vaccinated and rip the mask off and go dancing around. No. And you especially don't want medical personnel to think that. Right. And, oh, go ahead, Rich. I just, I fully, I have fully anticipated for some time uh, the restrictions staying in place, at least in my head and in my practice, until basically a, a number of uh, a fraction of the human population, uh, the U S population had been vaccinated that uh, could theoretically lead to herd immunity. Okay. Yeah. And, and I was just going to point out that um, people should also remember that this vaccine has gone through trials with getting two doses. Um, and so you certainly wouldn't want to rip your mask off after dose number one. Um, you need to have both doses and have some time. There was, there has been some data um, that came out with all of this about um, the immunity after the first dose um, that looked pro potentially promising, but that might not be uh, very long duration immunity. Um, that's one of the benefits of a boost. Yeah, I wouldn't um, depend so, on that. I would get both yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I and would too. In all of the publications that we've looked at reporting on clinical trials, I have been repeatedly impressed by the fact that in order to get uh, a the really maximum effect in terms of antibody response, you needed two doses. The boost was doing something every time. Yeah, Kathy, you had a few more things you wanted to tell us about. Well, I just remember that on the TWIV last Friday, somebody brought up the fact that the AstraZeneca uh I think phase two, phase three trial data hadn't been published, but that evidently came out yesterday <laughs> in the uh, Lancet. Great. So uh, maybe they were listening, but probably they were preparing to do it anyway. Yeah. Good. We'll and yeah. also something that I haven't really looked at at all, but an article from the Times UK that uh, they're proposing to have some trials where they'll test the Oxford uh, Chadox vaccine, 
that's what's the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer mRNA vaccine to boost protection. So they're planning those mix and match vaccines. Hmm. Hmm. Um, And the other thing is that, um, as I have come to notice, that the UK calls it jabs and we call it shots. And so every time you read an article, you can figure out where it's been written, if it's jabs or, or shots. They have a different, you, for them, shots mean something else, right? <laughs> did, did you see any of the stories about the first uh, recipients in the UK no. um, being vaccinated? They're, they're, so they've been showing the first few people who have been getting vaccinated. The first one was a 90-year-old woman, and she's on the covers of all sorts of papers. But the second person who was vaccinated um, was an older gentleman named William Shakespeare, Ah, cool. So <laughs> there also were lots of funny stories That's about you know, Shakespeare and the vaccine. That's great. Right. Love it. I also had a follow up from the blood bank story that we that I talked about last week. It uh, had a um, corresponding author from the CDC that I know, Natalie Thornburg. And Vincent and Brianne were interested in knowing about blood bank samples from earlier than uh, December. And so... They didn't have samples available from September to November of 2019. So they used what the Red Cross had banked to look at arbovirus antibodies originally, and then they were Mm. repurposed. So while you might say, oh, yeah, the Red Cross has it all, they're going to have some limit on their freezer space at some point, (laughs) and they can't can't save everything. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, So... uh, but I did become aware that a med archive was posted yesterday. So that's a preprint, not yet peer reviewed, where they looked at October to April samples from Seattle. And in that study, they didn't see any positives until April, but it's a much smaller study, about a tenfold smaller study. And they only had 89 and 87 samples from October and November of 2019. And so um, the study that I talked about last week had about 1% to 2% positive. And you can imagine if you had less than 100 samples and only 1% positivity, you just don't have enough numbers yet. So That's why, you, Rich, you said Eric Delward. I bet he has some. Yeah, it could be. Eric, you listening? <laughs> Remember we took a tour of the blood bank and all those minus 70s in the freezers and they're all like wired up to phone lines in case they warm up to call somebody. Yeah, that was a fascinating tour. Very cool. Good time with Eric. you're listening. Eric, do you you have samples (laughs) earlier? What's the story? (laughs) We want to know. Well, and as we're we're discussing this and the difference between uh, New York and Seattle, what flashes to my mind is wondering what, uh, how much traffic there is between China and either of those cities, okay? Um, in fact, I'll bet you Seattle has a significant yeah, amount of traffic sure. oh, yeah. Yeah, to yeah. China. Yes, it's, yeah, both coasts for sure. All right, let's go to some picks. Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, I have something that I found on Twitter that is really fantastic. Um, so this is a set of patterns for virus snowflakes um, from the Center for Virus Research on the Hutchinson Lab at the University of Glasgow. Um, so um, the link takes you to a PDF um, that has uh, a whole set of um, little snowflake patterns. Here's an example um, <laughs> where you can actually um, cut out the shape, cut along these dotted lines and unfold and you'll end up with a virus um, that looks like a snowflake. Um, there, so there are about 20 or so, um, including coronaviruses and influenza viruses um, and all sorts of other things. Um, they're listed as easy, medium, or hard. I was uh, looking at one of the patterns that was uh, described as hard, and I was not sure that my crafting skills were up to it. <laughs> um, but they look really cool, and I am excited to actually cut them out and make them as uh, some decorations um, for the winter time. So I think they look really cool. Not going to make some doily, virus doilies, uh, Brianne? <laughs> <laughs> um, my craft skills are very, very uh, well, elementary. It's a machine. <laughs> so no. But you know, yeah. well, I was looking at those doilies, and I I can understand why she did it because it's blurred. You can't tell, right? A doily yeah. is almost like a a virus. It's just yeah, amazing. 
I wonder what she this does. Cool. Does anyone oh. know what, what she does with all those things? Like the rugs. Oh, remember the rugs uh, or whatever in the beginning yeah. of the different. They're, the, they're art exhibits. Yeah. But does, Maybe. do people buy them or they get stored in the museums or does she store them? I was thinking them? that somebody should buy one of the pox virus ones for rich. I would, well, I was thinking of buying it for myself. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> Could be rich buying it for rich. Yeah. <laughs> but do you, but do most artists store things in their place or do museums store Store them as part of their permanent. Col col I, I don't know how it works. I don't know any of this stuff. If a museum owns it, or then yeah. they have it stored. If they're not displaying it, if they don't own it, then it's often on loan from the yeah. artist or from the owner. So artists so. do have space for storing things like that. Well, th as much as anybody has space for storing. Yeah, I, sh yeah. I wanted to ask her that. So if you're listening, Laura, I'm curious. To know. <laughs> <laughs> what I like on on this is the uh, Mimi virus because then it has the Sputnik virophage on it too. Yeah. Yes, it's yeah, That's really cool. cool. Yep. Yeah, and and they all have a little bit of information about the virus, and you know, some some nice things to read. So I think they're really cool looking. I'm really excited to make them. Uh, nicely consistent with our theme for the day. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. It is. Rich, what do you have? I have a uh, link to a NASA uh, news uh, post that's titled, New Data Confirm 2020 SO to be the Upper Centaur Rocket Booster from the 1960s. This, was, uh, this has been in the news. Uh, but it interested me, so I uh, looked into it uh, a little more deeply. And I'll uh, this link does uh, most of it. Did I actually put the wiki link in there mm. as well? Yes, I have a little wiki link as well on the same thing. Um, so uh, let me try and do this uh, briefly. There are observatories around the world that keep track of stuff that's headed for Earth for a variety of reasons, <laughs> uh, one of which is the observatory on Maui. Um, and, the, you know, flags go up when something looks like it's going to make a close encounter with the Earth. And there was one sighting uh, this year, this thing's called 2020 SO, that caught their attention, among other things, because it had a funny uh, trajectory that looked as if it was being buffeted by solar wind more than you would expect for a rock. They say more like a tin can, which turns out to be true. <laughs> so uh, that immediately aroused their suspicions and some further investigation looked at the uh, orbit uh, over, uh, of this thing over time and came to the conclusion that it had such a close encounter with the Earth in the 60s that, in fact, it could have even originated from the Earth. <laughs> so they're starting to think, oh, so this may be some artifact from a launch uh, from the Earth. Further investigation, now they're getting it might be a rocket booster. Further investigation, I thought this was fascinating, took spectra from this thing uh, and compared it to a spectrum from stainless steel, uh, which they would, uh, these boosters would have been made of or had a significant composition of. And it was close, but not quite. So they figured, well, but it's stainless steel that's been out in space for 54 years. So we'll compare it to some other known booster that's been in space for 54 years and they got a match. So in the end, it turns out that this thing, although we don't have a you know precise visual representation of it, is uh, confirmed to be uh, a discarded second stage booster from a Centaur rocket that was launched in 1966 for the Surveyor 2 mission to the moon that was ultimately an unsuccessful mission, though this booster did its job uh, correctly. The, there was a misfire of a thruster on the actual landing craft later on that caused it to, uh, to crash. And since the 60s, this thing has been primarily, and this is one of the reasons I put in the Wikilink, because the Wikilink has an animation of the orbit. Uh, it's been in an orbit that basically uh, mimics the Earth's orbit around the sun. Uh, but has a different periodicity. So at times it's very far away from the Earth on the other, other side of the sun. At times it's close. And when it gets close, like now, uh, it can do a little Watusi that brings it into the Earth's uh, gravitational influence. And it'll do a couple of orbits around the Earth and then sling back out into a solar orbit. Mm. So it's fascinating. Yeah. 
which is exactly what you do to leave orbit, right? You sling out or yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> now, so, so originally, why did it leave orbit? Because it was pushing the thing towards the moon? Is that right? Or what, uh, what? Yes. Okay, so this is the second stage booster. Uh, okay. uh, with these things, I, typically the first stage uh, comes back into the atmosphere. And yeah, of course, yeah. now we know with the way Falcon works now, they, yeah, they, they can actually recover these things. Second stage, actually the SpaceX uh, toyed with the idea of trying to recover the second stage boosters. Uh, but that uh, proved to be ultimately impractical. And these things, I think, have a variety of different fates, but mostly they become space junk of one sort or another. I didn't realize that space junk could include a solar orbit uh, that could mimic the Earth's orbit and at times leave it totally on the other side of the sun from the Earth. It's really weird. And that you could get these wacky orbits where it comes in proximity and does a couple of loops and then takes off again. So the, when we sent pe people to the moon, there were probably boosters that went off somewhere else too, Absolutely. Right? Okay. Yeah, I think there's junk all over the place. What What is SO? Uh, I tried to figure that out. Like, what is it space object or spectral object or yeah. something? And well, all I could do, I don't think it has any particular, I mean, to the people who named it, it probably has something, uh, a designation. But if you look at the um, objects that have been identified by the telescope that identify this one, you get a whole list of objects, each of which has a year. Uh, and then a couple, two or three letters after it that don't make any sense to me. For all I know, it's the initials of the person who first looked at it, okay? Got it. Uh, it may have more significance to that, but I couldn't find any significance. Okay, cool. Very cool. Interesting you should ask. This is the kind of nerdy stuff we do, right? Yeah. <laughs> what does CSO mean? Oh, right? I, I, actually, <laughs> I, do. I, I also wondered about it, and I sort of told myself it was sighted object and moved Could be on. sighted, space, yeah. I looked it up well, just maybe, now. I couldn't find it, yeah. Maybe somebody out there knows and they'll write I'm it sure and tell they us will. what means. I'm sure they will. Okay, Kathy, what do you have? So I've been asked, uh, it was about more than a month ago, it was right after the Nobel Prizes were announced, to give a presentation on the Hepatitis C Nobel Prizes. The Center for Complex Systems or some entity for complex systems here at the university has done this. They'll do it tomorrow, December 10th, the day that the prizes are always awarded. And there'll be somebody speaking about each of the different ones, physics and so forth. And so I have been totally immersed in hepatitis C for the last week solid, pretty much. I feel like I'm already starting to lose this vast amount of hepatitis C information that I took in. But uh, as part of that, of course, Vincent had pointed out that the Nobel Prize site has always the press release, an advanced information document, and those are very helpful. They also have, I happened to notice that they were going to be live streaming the lectures, which were all given remotely. And so I have the link here for the hepatitis C ones and also the link to all of them uh, throughout the week. I think, in fact, they're probably all finished by today or maybe even yesterday um, and the uh, concert that's being given. And in preparing for this, I also read a recent review article by each of the Nobel Prize winners. So Harvey Alter, Michael Houghton and Charlie Rice. Uh, that are really historical types of reviews. And Harvey Alters is just amazing because it's written in first person from the patient known as patient H. And uh, the patient had given permission a long time ago to share this information, but the journal article didn't know that it was going to be this um, raconteur type of uh, article. And uh, it's just really well done. And it, helped bring out more of the personality of Harry Alter that I got from his lecture on Monday. Uh, and then, I, th as I said, there's one by each of the other two. I didn't put the links in here, but um, uh, Michael Houghton's has a nice picture of the uh, clone 511 and so forth. And uh, something that I really liked in Charlie Rice's at the end is that he thinks there's four basic lessons we learn from basic research. Uh, one is that we learn by analogy to other viruses. So we compare what's already known. And for our new virus, we see what we can learn from that. And number two, 
we have to remember that every virus has surprises. Number three, animal models can be simultaneously required and completely optional. So in the case of hepatitis C, early on, the only animal model that could be infected was chimpanzees. And now that their cell culture, it works out to be okay that we're no longer allowed to do research on chimpanzees. But before um, even there was cell culture models, there were ways to study the virus uh, not in animal models. And the fourth is that uh, he said he's really impressed by the fact that technology has shortened the timeline for HCV and other virus discoveries. I want to tell you that this review article was published in 2019. So it's very appropriate for the fact that technology has shortened the timeline for HCV and other virus discoveries, as in SARS-CoV-2 in 2020. A lot of different uh, nested pick-like things that Rich is famous for, but... Well, this Harvey, this Harvey Alter article, I, I had a look at it, is just phenomenal. It's really great. It's a, some, it's this person, it's an imagined thing, this person talking from the grave. It's a real person. His, yes, I know. Oh, yeah, okay. But yeah. the conversation, I mean, obviously right. he's dead, right? Right, right. But it's a title, Reflections on the History of HCV, a Posthumous Examination. And it's just so... Uh, clever and 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 uh, despite its sort of mm, somewhat uh, amusing or frivolous nature, quite respectful of all of the individuals involved. It's just it's great. It's so creative. Yes. Um. I and I was thinking as I was reading it that you know this is a good um, explanation of the basic science that a lay person could read and be entertained. Mm -hmm. It would uh, in uh, as um. Laura described it, it would engage their attention, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really nice. And I also thought about the chimpanzee thing again, because you talked about how the first experiments were to infect a chimpanzee with uh, uh, blood from uh, this patient. And I was thinking, man, you can't do chimpanzees anymore. And then I thought, well, but now you wouldn't need to. Nope. Okay. You could, you could do the same thing without the chimpanzee. Nope. Very interesting. To sequence right. the patients here. You yeah, can. absolutely. Right. So, and, and just so you know, this patient uh, died at age 92 of heart problems. He right. uh, actually got, um, had a, an early on triple bypass surgery and received blood transfusions and then was monitored for his post-transfusion <clears throat> uh, hepatitis and uh, monitored for years and donated samples that, as Rich said, ended up... Uh, being important for the research. So are they having all these Nobel ceremonies uh, remotely this year? I'm not sure what they're doing tomorrow for the actual day that, that it's awarded, but um, they did say at the end of the lectures, uh, we look forward to welcoming you here at such time as, as can be done. So, oh, okay. you know, all three of those lectures were done by Zoom. I hope they're not having that dinner with people crammed next to each other for hours. No, they can't possibly. They're not in Stockholm. The, every, you know, all three of these guys are in North America. Yeah. So here has here has a very different meaning nowadays. Yeah. Than it, uh, <laughs> right. Than so it they're used to. not having the awards in in Sweden and the dinner in Correct. Sweden. Then okay. Correct. That's it, well, the that's person good. in Sweden in the hall in Sweden said, "We look forward to welcoming yeah, one you day, here yeah. at some day, some yeah, other day." Good. I'm yeah. glad to hear that. I was going to say, I hope they're not going to make them yeah. come. Great. All right. My pick is a book called The Right Stuff by Tom Wolf, which I read many years ago. And the reason I'm picking it is because uh, one of the heroes, Chuck Yeager, has just died at 97. And I just remember, you know, the book is, is about the American space uh, program and the, uh, the early astronauts. But, you know, in the first part of it, Chuck Yeager plays a role and I was just most impressed with his portrayal in that book. You know, they're trying to break the sound barrier and pilot after pilot would just crash and burn. And he just got in this thing, the X1, I think it was. And yeah. so, yeah, sure. No problem. It's just incredibly brave. And uh, that really was made an impression. And he did, he did it, you know, as well. And so, and I just remember him saying, you know, 
I don't want to go up in space. I don't want to be shot up there and come back down. I want to fly my plane, <laughs> which of course now you can do in, in many ways. But back then it was just up and down. <laughs> so I like it. And uh, it's a great book. I haven't read it in ages, but when I, I still remember when I saw that he died. Wow, 97, he had a good life or a long life yeah. anyway. It's pretty cool. PBS NewsHour did, a, did an obituary for him uh, couple of days ago that had some interviews and I uh, was impressed with his humility, you know, good, good. it's just, Oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a test pilot. Yeah. Uh, this is pilot. what I do. Yeah. You know? Just doing my job. Yeah. I gotta be pretty brave to do that. Right. I think it's amazing. All right. We have a listener pick from Mikhail in Finland, where the weather, Southern Finland, where the weather's minus four C with sunshine for the few hours of daylight, no snow on the ground yet. I'd like to point you to an interesting story in chemical and engineering news about the recent discovery of structures of many viral fusion proteins in the pre-fusion configuration. Doing this involved genetic modification of select amino acid residues to stabilize the unstable proteins in pre-fusion configuration. Incidentally, this also led uh, direct application of many of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines and also new uh, respiratory syncytial virus vaccines under development. So, uh, it's a good article. It nicely summarizes, you know, from the perspective of the people who did it. Uh, and Jason McClellan figures prominently, Barney Graham and others, uh, this idea of of making the prefusion, which is where the epitopes are that you need for neutralization. Um, so it's it's a nice article. Interestingly, the Excellent. Oxford Chaddox vaccine does not use this little trick. I'm just an ophthalmologist. <laughs> I guess you can see well, right? But I wonder if it could be the reason we see a difference in efficacy between the mRNA vaccines and this one. I guess J&J's ad vaccine might answer this question since it does contain a modified prefusion stabilized form. Merry Christmas. I think not. I think there are other reasons for the difference between the Chadox because I think the epitopes are mainly similar. But anyway, it's a good article. Check it out. And that'll do it for TWIV691. We're going to hit... As I said last time, 700 on, on the, just before the end of this year. That's pretty cool. Uh, you can find all the show notes at microbe.tv slash twiv. Send your questions and comments. We'll get to them. They're a lot. Great. They're, I love reading them. We'll get to them. Twiv at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Brian Barker is at Drew University over on Twitter. Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>